Well, folks, a lot of people have asked me about this movie recently, The King, which if you ask me is a little unfortunately named because it's a very generic title. And then there's the all hail in the subtitle, which makes me wonder, is that a Duke Nukem reference? Hail to the king, baby. Anyway, so I want to talk about one particular fight scene there, which is an armored duel. But first about a different, more modern kind of armored battle. I want to give a quick thanks and shout out to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. World of Warships is a free-to-play online strategy game on PC and Mac with millions of players worldwide. It's a great mix of action and strategy. It requires a lot of forward thinking and precise maneuvering. You know, like parking. Except with guns and explosions. So like parking in Texas, I guess. You want to get that perfect angle to optimize the alignment of your guns while minimizing the exposure of your ship. It's very rewarding when you get it right. The in-game models are actually based off 3D scans of real ships and some of the most iconic naval vessels in history for that matter. It takes the developer six months to make a ship. Well, that kind of dedication to realism and detail I can definitely appreciate. They also constantly add new missions, events, and updates. One of them is coming soon, Submarines. This will introduce new mechanics, prioritizing stealth over health. As a new player, you can register with the code BATTLESTATIONS2020 to get a bonus starter pack, which includes 250 doubloons, 1 million credits, the USS Charleston, 3 days premium time, and one port slot, among others. It's available for free on Xbox and PS4 as well, so click the link in the description down below to try out World of Warships. All right, so let's take a look at the king. The early 15th century. What a fun time to be alive. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to talk about the historical accuracy of the armor. Uh, the Metatron has already criticized that, and uh, all I would say about it is you can, of course, pluck it apart for accuracy, like any movie, really. They're never 100% accurate. At least it's extremely rare to find that. And uh, there's always some liberty taken with the historical material, both as far as events are concerned and personalities and etc etc really however what i will say is that it's not blatantly obviously what the heck you know i've seen a lot of really terrible stuff where they misplace really crude approximations of armor in completely different time periods even though it's not 100 percent accurate when i look at scenes like this for example there's nothing that really jumps out at me that makes me go what the fluff is that supposed to be you know unlike for example, Vikings, where they look like a bunch of LARPers who just raided a Comic-Con. This actually, you can tell that it's real steel armor, it's not just painted plastic, and looks pretty decent overall. So this sword looks really neat. In fact, when I first looked at this, I was wondering, did they use an Albion Regent? Because it looks quite a lot like that. But the blade is very different. Uh, the hilt that the region is inspired by is from the mid-15th century. So a bit later than the time when the, this movie takes place, but close enough. And it's nice to see a properly shaped sword. Well, with one exception, really, the blade shapes are kind of wrong here. Particularly for this application and as for the time period if you look at they're relatively wide they don't really taper noticeably while the oak shot type 18 and other swords from that time period have a noticeable taper in the profile and the reason for that is at the time plate had become a lot more common and covered the body much more extensively than before less more plate than male now and so you needed to be able to deal with that and now we're getting to one of the problems with this fight i can tell you right now that overall it's quite well done especially compared to a lot of other things i've seen but um the one weird thing is if you look at the amount of armor they have pretty solid plate they're mostly covered the gaps are covered with mail, but most of the body is covered in plate. And they use a lot of cuts. Now, they do use thrusts, and there are definitely some things that I really like about this scene. I'll get into that in a bit more detail. But there's a reason why the blades at that time were generally more tapered. Not exclusively, you could always expect to see quite a bit of variation. But even from the earlier 14th century, you have pretty extreme forms like this, which really tapers to a pretty fine needle point. And you keep seeing at least a slight profile taper in most of the historical manuals that deal with armored fighting. Why is that? 
Well, because this sort of armor is pretty much impervious to cuts. Sure, you can try to strike it as hard as possible, which will still bruise and rattle the wear underneath, especially strikes with the helmet, of course, could potentially cause concussions and all that. But it's just not going to be that effective. It's going to do generally more damage to the blade than to the armor and the wearer. So it's much more effective to use thrusts. Now, of course, it wouldn't make much sense to try to thrust a sword blade into a visor as solid as this one. This is all about protection at the cost of visibility and breathability. But the way it's done here, it still makes sense. There's this thrust to the face, which is actually out of measure, meaning at a distance where it can hit the opponent. But the natural reaction to having something go toward your face and your eyes is to do something about it, either flinch or, or try to evade or some sort of response. So instead of following through with it, he actually turns it into a cut and his opponent keeps moving backwards to evade that. And then there's a nice deflectional strike against this cut here, which was rather clumsy though, overreaching, totally off balance, just stumbling past the opponent. That's not great. Then we've got a bunch of cuts and thrusts that wouldn't really do anything against armor, but this part here I really like. So this cut is parried with half sorting, supporting the blade with the offhand for a stronger block and mainly to have more control over the point. And then that leads to grappling, which again is very common in the historical manuals. There's a takedown. And from here, this I'm, I suppose was done just to extend the fight a little longer because essentially at that point, it might as well be over because the correct thing to do once you've taken the, the opponent down is to draw your dagger, which both of them have, and thrust it into the gaps of the armor, either through the, the slit in the visor, if it's large enough, or into the throat and trying to get through the, the mail that's covering that, or under the arms, or you know any of the, of the other openings that present themselves in armor. Or ideally, you would threaten the opponent with the dagger and force him to surrender, and then you can ransom him, depending on the situation. So this is a little bit odd. I mean, scuffles like that may have happened in historical fighting. It's not shown in the manuals. It's not what you're supposed to do. Now, of course, real life doesn't always go as well as it should. Sometimes things do get messy, and that's perfectly reasonable. And also, what likes you can really tell that these guys are exhausted already. You know, it's easy to say, oh, already they haven't been fighting for that long. I, you, can, you can hear them wheezing and, and breathing heavily. Imagine the weight that you're carrying. Now, it's distributed across the entire body, so it, it's not going to slow you down as much as people may think, but just endurance-wise, this is a major strain to be moving around uh, not just with that much weight on you and, and you know rolling around and getting up and down all of that But also considering that you don't get as much much oxygen as you normally would Being encased in steel and of course overheating imagine you're doing intense cardio in winter clothing or worse and Some more of the thrust that those thrusts were actually aimed better They seem to have been aimed at the throat where there's only male covering so that makes more sense. There's some more half-sorting. Um, there was a strike with, with the guard, which is good, but they don't actually use the more common techniques in the manuals, which would be the murder stroke, Mordschlag, as it's called in the German tradition. The point of that, if you don't know already, is you're basically turning this into a bludgeon. This is where most of the mass is. Of course, you're reversing the weight distribution and this will hit way harder. It's more exhausting to wield and not as fast and agile, but this is essentially an improvised mace. So striking somebody in the helmet with the pommel or the guard, very effective, would cause concussions, uh, knock them out, maybe even brain hemorrhaging, etc. Plus denting the armor with blunt impact like that would make it harder to move in it because all the plates are really precisely shaped and fitted together to allow for maximum freedom of movement. So if one of them are, one of the plates is deformed, it won't slide 
into the other anymore and then things get locked up. You may not be able to move your arms as well anymore. Uh, if the breastplate is severely dented, you may get trouble breathing, etc. So at this point, they're just kind of stumbling about because they're completely exhausted. Now, although it makes sense, I think they exaggerated the exhaustion a little bit, maybe. Because considering that knights and men at arms would be trained from a young age and go through rigorous physical exercise to build up the strength and endurance they need to fight in armor for prolonged periods of time. So after just a couple of minutes being this exhausted for a knight, not great. I see what they're going for here, but I think they're overstating that problem a little bit. So at that point... <laughs> He's just dropping to the floor just from having struck with a sword. Just, just gonna, uh, I'm done. Boom. So that, that's maybe a bit much. But now we're getting to the point that, uh, that should have happened earlier. As soon as you've wrestled the opponent to the ground, subdued them, you're on top with a dagger. That's really it. Uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to fight back you know, considering... You're on the ground in full armor. The opponent is also in full armor on top of you. There's a lot of weight resting on you. So at that point, you have basically no chance, I'd imagine. So this is overall, like, again, there there are some strange things in there and then some less realistic parts. But then again, realism also always depends on the skill. And an individual skill could vary quite a bit, even in case of a knight or a man-at-arms. They went through rigorous training and all that. They were expected to be competent at fighting. But nowadays, soldiers are also expected to be a, perform at a very high level. But you will see differences, or police officers in particular. Not all of them will be perfectly fit, super performing athletes and everything. And you would see a wide range of skill and experience as well. So all in all, I think they did a pretty good job with this scene. Uh, ironically still the most realistic armored combat I've seen by far is from the anime Maria the Virgin Witch. I made a video about that and it's pretty ironic considering that there's magic and other fantasy elements in it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this overanalyzing look at the king. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks. Try out World of Warcraft. What? <laughs> Oops.